It was the fall of 1838, with persecutions against the Mormons becoming even more severe and intense than in months before. Mob violence was vicious, and the air rang with cries of strife and hatred. The life of the prophet Joseph Smith was in danger, as well as that of his brother and constant companion, Hiram. During the height of this persecution, Hiram was seized and taken from his home with hardly an opportunity to say goodbye to his wife, Mary. Hiram was dragged off to jail and court trial where he and Joseph were illegally sentenced to die. Twelve days later, Mary Fielding Smith gave birth to a son whom they named Joseph Fielding, generally known as Joseph F. Smith. Hiram saw his infant son for the first time when the child was three months old. These were trying times indeed for the whole Smith family. At one time, a group of enemies of the church ransacked the home while the mother lay critically ill and stole papers and other valuables belonging to Hiram, who was still in jail. Joseph F. later wrote of this incident in his diary. I, being an infant and lying on the bed, was entirely overlooked by the family during the fright. When the mob entered the room where I was, a mattress was thrown on top of me, completely smothering me up. When thought of and discovered, my existence was supposed to have come to an end. But subsequent events have proved their suppositions erroneous, however well-founded. Mary Smith soon moved her family from Missouri to Quincy, Illinois, hoping to find friendlier surroundings. Then Hiram moved his family a few weeks later to Nauvoo, the city of the saints. However, persecutions increased even more until the climax came five years later at Carthage Jail with the martyrdom of the prophet Joseph and Hiram. Joseph F. was a lad of only six when his father was killed. The fatherless and poverty-stricken family remained at their home in Nauvoo for nearly two years, but again mob harassment drove the saints from their homes. For Mary Fielding Smith, this was a time of many hardships and demands on her strength. She relied heavily on Joseph F. to do a man's work in spite of his tender years. It was Joseph F. who drove his mother's team across Iowa to winter quarters when he was only eight years old. And then, at the age of 10, he drove two yoke of oxen more than 1,000 miles across the plains to the Salt Lake Valley. He was extremely sensitive to the hardships placed upon the leaders of his ox team, Tom and Joe, which he had raised from calves. He recounted with deep emotion the circumstances. Many times while traveling sandy or rough roads, long thirsty drives, my oxen lowing with the heat and fatigue, I would put my arms around Tom's neck and cry bitter tears. That was all I could do. Tom was my favorite and best and most willing and obedient servant and friend. Four years after entering the Salt Lake Valley, another great sadness came to Joseph F. His beloved mother died. Of Mary Fielding Smith, Joseph remarked, The strongest anchor in my life which helped me to hold to every principle was the love of my dear mother. But Joseph F. was accustomed to caring for himself. He had worked as a teamster, herd boy, plow boy, irrigator, harvester, wood hauler, thresher, winnower. Responsibilities had matured him early. He was only 15 when he received his first mission call to Hawaii. At 16, he presided over the branch on the island of Maui. But physical hardships, discouragement, and illness almost overwhelmed him during his early months in Hawaii. He recalled, I was very much oppressed. I felt as if I was so debased in my condition of poverty, lack of intelligence and knowledge, just a boy, that I hardly dared look a man in the face. One night, after praying for relief from his afflictions, he was blessed with a comforting experience which increased his spiritual insight. He dreamed that he participated in some events with his parents, with President Brigham Young and the Prophet Joseph Smith. At one point, he touched the Prophet and felt his warmth. When I awoke that morning, I was a man. There was not anything in the world that I feared. That vision, that manifestation and witness that I enjoyed at that time has made me what I am, 
if I am good or clean or upright before the Lord. That has helped me through every trial and through every difficulty. He won the lifelong devotion of the natives through his love and concern for them during his almost four years in the islands. Two years later, he was called to serve a mission in England, leaving behind his bride of a year. After nearly three years, he returned home with the intention, in his own words, to settle down for a season and take care of my own. However, the church was experiencing difficulties in Hawaii because of the acts of an apostate elder, Walter Gibson. So once more, the call came to Joseph F. Because of his acquaintance with the islanders and their language, would he accompany apostles Lorenzo Snow and Ezra T. Benson to the islands to assist in straightening out the difficulties? After preliminary meetings in Hawaii, elders Snow and Benson returned home, leaving the youthful Joseph F. to preside over church affairs on the islands for the next few months, a demonstration of the trust and confidence church leaders placed in him. At the age of 25, he had served seven years in the mission field. Two years later, at the church historian's office, housed in the George A. Smith home, President Brigham Young ordained Joseph F. an apostle. The calling was not made public until a vacancy occurred, and he became a member of the Council of the Twelve. During that year, Joseph F. served as one of several counselors. Altogether, he served 52 years as a general authority, 22 of those years as counselor to four presidents, and 17 years as president of the church. When he was sustained as president at the age of 63, he became the first church president born of LDS parentage and the last to have seen the prophet Joseph Smith in person. Some of the most severe anti-Mormon campaigns ever unleashed marred the early years of President Smith's administration. One United States senator from Utah appealed to him for political support from the church. When President Smith informed him the church would not endorse candidates, the irate senator joined with anti-Mormon forces, which attacked President Smith in vicious ways for 10 years. To this abuse, President Smith made no answer except to express publicly his tolerance and forgiveness. 